So the answer to the question of like, well, what do we do? How does this relate to art? We become more sensitive. We become more dynamic. We, we have this incredible capacity to process information and we do it in ways that we absolutely cannot understand, right? And then the answer, so what do we do? We train our senses to be as sophisticated as we can. We, we, we have a greater concern about the affective dimension, like I've mentioned before to you, like affective, like the mood. And we think about ambiance and the way that the environment comes in and, and causes, you know, like the fact that we're recording in this space is affecting the conversation. Right. And becoming more aware of the way that context, um, the way that that content is contingent on context. Dear friends, it's Kurt Derdix. Welcome back. If this is your first time listening, I am so glad you found us this week. We welcome my brother, Christopher Derridix, for a conversation that's as rich and layered as your favorite, insert the blank. This is Fluxus. And now the experience begins. From his strategic post at U of O Center for Applied Second Language Studies, aka CASELS, for you acronym affectionados, to his world-hopping escapades that inspired his graphic memoir, Pocket Guide to Revolution. Christopher's a walking, talking kaleidoscope of cultures and ideas. We dive deep into the space between language, art, and the human experience. Brains, hearts, and the whole enchilada. We tiptoe along the tightrope of intercultural communication, ponder the complexities of the extended mind theory, and even offer our respectful take on the Fluxus art movement. We see you, Yoko Ono. You're still a legend. And by, and by the end, Christopher and I are, are like two John Lennon strumming air guitars in the melody of our conversations, minds melding with wonder of intellectual kinship, and of course, a dash of brotherly harmony. So tune in for a smart and heartfelt sing-along that'll leave you questioning the lyrics of your understanding and perhaps even whistling a brand new tune. So on to today's show, the man, the myth, the multilingual maven, Christopher Derridix. Christopher Derridix, my brother from the same mother. <laughs> <laughs> so nice to see you today. You're in your office in University of Oregon, Eugene. Yep. Yep. Here with the Fluxus capacitor behind us from the Mavericks Congress that you attended. Oh, that was so fun. What year was that? 2018? 2017? 2019. 2019. Okay. Wow. Yeah. Well, technically five years ago now almost. I mean, 2024, here we are. That's amazing. Time flies. Yeah. Um, well, I'm so looking forward to this. This is the first interview of 2024, I think appropriately so, auspiciously so. And uh, I love you so much and so inspired by you. And I think the work that you're doing is uh, profound and fundamental. And uh, uh, I think will be a framework for what I'm trying to achieve uh, with the podcast uh, moving forward, much more so. I've been doing it two and a half years and they say it takes five years to break through. So I think maybe some of this work and conversation will help uh, kind of expand and make it more impactful. So that there's so much I want to cover. But I guess having said that, uh, congrats on the the Fulbright. Uh, the, congrats on the, the Fulbright grant. You want to tell the audience a little bit about that in the context of what you do? Yeah, thanks so much. Um, so I'll back up a little bit. Um, I work at the Center for Applied Second Language Studies at the University of Oregon. And we're one of uh, 16 uh, national language resource centers. And it's our job through uh, the grant that we receive from the Department of Education to enhance the nation's language learning capacity, right? So we're here to do things to support teachers and learners in being able to, uh, to learn languages and to meet the demands of the, the world 
the inter the increasingly interconnected world to be able to communicate effectively um, as the you know as the world continues to become more and more complex and dynamic and and we're one of 16 centers that's here to help the nation get better uh, equipped to communicate so the Fulbright uh, and and my role my role at the center is uh, currently development and learning strategy so Fulbright uh, for the last maybe five years now um, the university has had a grant to run the pre-departure orientation for um, Fulbright scholars who are coming from around the world uh, to the United States and who are in the United States and going to go around the world. And for one week before they depart, uh, there's a, an orientation that the State Department and uh, I think it's IIE, I think it's the Institute for International Education, uh, they run for these grantees and we um, have been participating with them over that time uh, through uh, a mixed reality experience. Like, so there's this whole week long thing and we've been playing a tiny little part of that for the last several years um, by, by offering this mixed reality experience where the Fulbrighters, uh, before they leave, get some intercultural communicative competence training. And um, the person who organized that grant here on campus, who who's got, got the grant, he's retired. And he said uh, to us, he's a mentor. He was a faculty member when I was in the linguistics department. And um, he said, hey, I think that this is something you guys should consider applying for as I'm uh, retiring. And, um, and so we did. I was really compelled personally. I, I thought that this would be a really good thing for us to do. We're currently receiving funds from the, the Department of Education and to get money that was coming from the State Department seemed like a really good thing and something that I'd been interested in sort of escalating. So we applied for it and we got it. So we're now, um, I am the coordinator for the, uh, it's the, it's the Europe and Eurasia um, Fulbright pre-departure orientation. Uh, the grant is a five-year cycle and so we have our first pre-departure orientation happening in June and I'll be, I've been with this group in the past but like I said it was just in a really small capacity and so this time I'll be like coordinating all of the speakers and working with the State Department and IIE to get everything in order beforehand and it does feel like a huge win. We're collaborating with the um, the Division of Global Engagement here on campus and uh, and others and uh, it's just a, a group effort but I'm, I'm really delighted to be able to be the person uh, kind of spearheading it on campus. Amazing. Congrats again. Thanks. The, the uh, CASELS, um, what is CASELS, the, the program you work for, stand for? Yeah, the Center for Applied Second Language Studies. Center for Applied Second Language Studies. That's great. And uh, how long have you been with the group now? I think it's almost eight years now. Yeah, remarkable. Well, I remember skiing with you and dad and uh, Dale Okuno, uh, my mentor, our mentor, and he was my seed investor at uh, City Source. And I think and you had you wanted to go and get a master's degree and you went off to St. John's and had a vision for doing this. And, and uh, that must have been over 10 years ago now. And here you are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I did the St. John's I did. So this is, so yeah, a little, little sort of organizing those St. John's. I did a, a master's in liberal arts at St. John's, a great books program. And that was like in Santa 15, Fe, New Mexico, in Santa Fe. Yeah. They have a campus yeah. in Annapolis and a campus in Santa Fe. I was at uh, the campus in Santa Fe for four years and ended up with a master's in liberal arts, basically the history of Western thought kind of like, the philosophical tradition of the West studied math and natural science and um, history and philosophy and theology um, and politics and society kind of chrono each each of those strands chronologically and then uh, about um, seven or eight years after I finished that program uh, I had done some travel uh, some language study while I was traveling for a year and had a really profoundly transformative experience during that language uh, study and, and travel. And I, I tried, I had been looking for sort of a way to organize my experience and make sense of the world. And the travel did something really powerful. And so I thought like, oh, I think that then my career had been kind of like it, it, I had been 
working a very slow boil. And so, yeah, you're right. When we were on that ski trip, I was, I think I was applying for the program at that point um, in linguistics and language teaching at the University of Oregon. And I'm a very uh, proud uh, alum of that program. I, I feel like it's been an incredible uh, community to participate in. And I still work with those colleagues and opportunities are coming through that uh, language teaching specialization program that I did. And it was great that it was in the linguistics department too, because I was able to have a little bit more. So even though it was the focus was on language learning and an educational kind of motivation, I was still able to get all of the kind of more philosophical, more kind of intellectually charged uh, content that was coming through the linguistics department. So I took an incredible course on um, uh, linguistic relativity having to do with like, based on what language you speak, uh, how does that change your perspective on life and your experience of life and what you might be able to experience or not experience depending on the language that you um, that you grew up speaking, uh, which is pretty far out. I'll just say like a caveat, like when we when yeah. he taught that class, he's like, this is not something that people normally study with any kind of integrity. Um, we're, we're going out on a limb, but we're going to really do like a deep dive scientific kind of account of, of all of this stuff. And um, I also got to take that philosophy of language course with Mark Johnson that I'm sure I've mentioned to you a bunch of times that was like, kind of like a spiritual experience. Mark Johnson co authored metaphors we live by with George Lakoff and did a bunch of really, really powerful work um, around language theory and philosophy of language. So, so yeah, it was a great, it was a really great uh, place to be and to learn. And uh, the director of our center here at Castles is a, a member of the faculty at the university uh, in the linguistics department, Julie Sykes. And she's um, been an incredible mentor and leader and friend. So yeah, I, I just couldn't be happier to be here. Yeah, Julie's awesome. Uh, and then the when you did your year around the world trip, which was amazing, uh, profound. Uh, that's a great story. Uh, tell that story quickly, and then the book that came out of that, and if there's a way that people can get the book. Oh boy, I'm not sure I want to do that. <laughs> well, how about so? Just tell me how how just how many countries, yeah. and you were yeah, basically yeah, in a, yeah, 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 you, yeah. You went yeah. to Hoth. You was like you did it like on a 15 grand budget or something crazy. Yeah, yeah. I traveled for a year. I went um, to my uh, sort of this. This makes sense of kind of how I ended up where I am. I, I went to my high school foreign exchange partner's house for the summer in Germany. So the trip I went for the summer to visit my foreign exchange partner had an amazing time studying German, uh, kind of getting back into that. And and there was an aspect of that that was about. I had just gone through a divorce and I was totally heartbroken and, and it, my head was really noisy. There was a lot of like, there was a lot going on inside. And part of my intention was to see if I could turn off my English speaking brain and, and just kind of d swim in this new space and, and, and experience life in a different way. So I went, I had an amazing time that summer. Um, I was, I would watch the news. I would meet with conversation partners. And uh, in the news, I remember all of the stuff was happening in Egypt. Hosni Mubarak was on trial. Um, I really didn't want to go back home. And so uh, I, I just didn't feel done. I didn't feel like a, my experience had opened up enough. And so I, um, I was a, on couchsurfing.org and I, I messaged some people in Egypt and I said, hey, is it safe? And everybody said, yeah, it's totally safe. I ended up connecting with uh, somebody from Oregon. I stayed that, with That him. was the Arab Spring. Was that 2020 or 2011, 2012? Yeah, yeah, right in it. So I got, yeah. to, I got to Egypt and, and yeah. uh, 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 Tahrir Square was, was live with activity. Um, I went to uh, the, I think it's called the Bar Harea, maybe something like that, where all the journalists and like where the scene was, where they were. Yeah you know, talking about like the, 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 the Arab Spring, this revolution yeah. was sort of afoot. And um, there was tear gas and, and um, all kinds of really interesting um, cultural activity. And um, ultimately, I felt like I thought I was going to stay there for longer. But after two months, it wasn't about the Arab Spring. It was just like the culture in general. It was just so loud. And I'm, I'm pretty like noise sensitive and, and kind of sensitive to all of the, the turmoil. Um, that, so that's then just, you go after that? Yeah. So, so I, so I booked, so one day kind of on a whim, 
I, I was like, I got to get out of here. I saw an ad for a flight to Kuala Lumpur for like $200. And I thought, I'm not exactly sure where Kuala Lumpur is, but I think it's pretty dang far away. And that sounds like a good value. And so I, I looked on the map and I saw that it was down, you know, like uh, in Malaysia by Indonesia. And I thought, I'll buy it. I bought it. And then I was off. And uh, and when I when I landed in Egypt, coming down, it was so romantic. It was at sunset and it was like the sky was really thick and red. And I thought to myself, I, in my heart, I felt like I'm going home the other way. Like I'm not going back. I'm not going to fly back uh, across Europe. Yeah, you're going like, to be like Magellan and circumnavigate. I'm going to keep going east. Yeah. So I went yeah. to Kuala Lumpur and then uh, and then I went to Vietnam for a couple months and then I was in uh, Philippines briefly, Hong Kong briefly, and then I flew to uh, from Hong Kong. I flew to Buenos Aires. And then when I was in Buenos Aires, I didn't get back in an airplane and I made my way over land all the way up to Colombia and then from Colombia to Panama by a tiny little sailboat for like a week and a half. And then uh, by bus um, from Panama all the way back to uh, L.A. And then Would you go through Baja, uh, Baja, California. Yeah, I got like halfway up the peninsula. And yeah. then and then cut across. I didn't. I was like, you know, yeah. like you gotta you be close to the safety. Yeah, I didn't yeah. want to get too close to the border. Yeah, yeah. and then uh, I remember you were you loved Cusco, Peru. That was an area that you just you hung out there for a minute, right? Yeah, yeah. I spent yeah. the most time. I think for the whole trip, the most time in Cusco, and had a really lovely time. I met some amazing people. Uh, mm. You know those environments where you feel you can feel something different in the place. You can feel like. Yeah. You know, and it's not super posh or anything. It wasn't that it, you know, it wasn't that it felt like, mm. well, I mean, it's beautiful in, in its own way, but it's not because it was so mm. well manicured. It's like just vibrant yeah. and alive. How long were you that gone the whole trip? Uh, exactly a year to the day. When I was, wow. in, when I was in Argentina, I spent uh, a month in uh, Mendoza, Argentina. And when I was there, I, I felt the draw to come home. I felt the beauty of Eugene in the summertime. Um, mm -hmm. and I thought to myself, I'm going home. Um, and I kind of did like a rough calculation about how long it might take me and how much time I wanted to spend still. And, and then I looked at my passport and I thought, oh, wow, like what I'm thinking really lines up to the day that I left. And so mm -hmm. I, I like, I actually left for, I left on foot from my house in Eugene with a, with two backpacks, yeah. I walked to the bus station uh flew okay, got on the bus flew around the world arrived by uh by train back to eugene walked home with the backpack exactly one year to the day uh, how did you feel when you walked in home accomplished <laughs> proud grateful yeah. to be home grateful yeah, to you, have a home yeah did you, did you shed a tear mm, i don't remember i don't think so yeah I'm sure at some point, yeah. Did um, what advice would you give just anybody that's contemplating uh, traveling around the world like that? What what how, how what was positive, and then and what was sort of some critical feedback you'd give on on how to do it better, safer, cheaper? Mm -hmm. different? Well, the first thing that comes to mind is you already mentioned Dale v very sweetly. Dale gave me a book before I left called Vagabonding by Ralph Potts which I highly, highly recommend. I think that that book actually had something to do with me being able to conceptualize that I, this is oh, something great. I could do. Oh, yeah. great. Love that. Yeah. Um, I think that the best advice I could give is that uh, the hardest part is leaving. Mm. The hardest part is just clearing your calendar enough to get away. And like I said, I, I did not plan on being gone for a year. I just planned mm. on taking a trip and... Uh, uh, but I had a sense that maybe I would I would not come home, um, and so once I left, that made it easy. Um, I mean, I, I think that there's a lot of like personal stuff about travel. People have the you know a way that suits them. For me personally, I I really liked, and I think I would recommend people considering um, staying in one place for longer. Like I got a lot of, like I got apartments, I got, I would rent rooms, you know, mm -hmm. in houses and stuff. And then, and then you get to meet people, you get to meet people who've been around longer, you get to make more connections. 
um, staying in youth hostels has that same kind of effect more than more so than hotels. Yeah. Uh, and of course it's just so much cheaper. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Any, where do you want to go back to and where, where did you not go that you'd like to get to at some point? I didn't get down to like Australia and New Zealand, so that would be fun. Um, but I don't really, nowadays I don't have a huge burning passion to travel much. I mean, there are some places I'm really curious to see. Uh, mm -hmm. I think Zanzibar would be a really interesting place to go. Uh, I think the Seychelles would be really, really interesting. Um, Morocco and the Blue City um, would be cool. I don't know what, there. it has an official name, that Blue City. It's up in the mountains, in the desert. Uh, but I can't remember the name. Um, I think you just charted out some Derek's vacation spots. Yeah. Yeah, I'd love to go. I mean, speaking of, if, yeah, if you frame it that way, um, yeah. I would love to go to like the Carpathian Mountains, the Transylvania area where some of our ancestors are from. I think that would be really interesting. Yeah. Uh, some of the most wild uh, country in Europe still, there are wolves mm -hmm. and bears uh, in ways that uh, aren't present in, in the rest of Europe. So I think that's really nice. They might even be our aunts and uncles. <laughs> <Ow>! <laughs> Um, well, that's amazing. And then you wrote a book out of it. Give us the quick uh, highlight on the book, the title. If, is it still in print if people want to get a hold of it? It's an okay, amazing okay. book. You wrote it and illustrated it, and I love it. I have a copy of it. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it's a graphic memoir. I mean, really, the, tr the way that, they, that it evolved was that I was blogging while I was traveling. And the blog was just a way of kind of keeping a record and processing. Like I said, I was I – was, post-divorce. I'm like trying to make sense of my experience. And so I was just writing uh, and drawing and trying to use, I was using my left hand, my non-dominant hand a bunch. And so I was just kind of getting weird, just letting myself unfurl a little bit. And that blog um, was like mildly successful. I mean, but this is like, what, this is like 2008 or something. This is so pretty early. 20, 2012. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. That's right. 2012. Yeah. Yeah. Um, or 11, maybe. What 2011, else? yeah. Um, so that blog, when I got home, when I, when I, so I get home and I have this whole blog and all of these drawings and, and I, I felt, uh, and I was out of money. I mean, the truth is I was out of money. And, uh, and I thought to myself, like, well, what could I do? Um, and I, I, had a, I had an idea to convert the blog into a book. And to, to re, I was interested in getting better at the Adobe Design Suite. And so to, I had done all the drawings by hand. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh, I knew that reformatting the, the small images, they were done really, really tiny on the blog. Um, and then uh, I thought it would be interesting to, to attempt to reformat them and to recondition everything. And it was an incredibly interesting experience to, to recondition material. And then that, yeah, that all became the book. Uh, Pocket Guide to Revolution, and it is available on Amazon. Uh, Pocket Guide to Revolution. It's in. It'll be in the show notes. Everybody, link to it. Oh, boy. and uh, Here I the love royalties. it. You have like the uh, the 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 Che Guevara kind of beret on, not right? Yep, little Che Guevara <laughs> cover. Yeah, and then and then the yeah. and then the way that the 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 structure of the book flows is I, I tried to. It was interesting because I had this like pretty homogenous set of content. The, the pictures were all like pretty consistent but putting it in a book i tried to figure out how to tell a narrative arc yeah you know? so the the way that the book the book really evolves the first pages are like literally black they're just black and then and then in the first chapter you you kind of get more order emerge and then and then i start kind of telling the story inserting the the blog posts and emails that i had been sending to friends and family along the way uh, mm -hmm. to kind of narrate and contextualize and to try to make sense. And it felt, it felt really compelling to me that the way that the story should unfold is that the, the, the reader should feel a journey. And that like, I was struggling with this sense of like, how do I, how do I, how do I resolve this narrative arc? And I, I, I felt like actually it was okay to have the, the experience evolve and to have the imagery sort of change tone and, um, but the writing's terse and really emotionally heavy, and the the images are really light and playful and goofy. So it's a really interesting sort of interplay between those things and the sort of developmental arc 
And, and of a, so it's a story of transformation. It's a story of my yeah. own sort of unfolding. Yeah, you, it must have been 2011 because I, I think I remember in 2012 I was in Baja and I had the book and you uh, know we were on vacation with some friends uh, and I had um, our friend Laura Howd had I read it and and I had it and she read it while we were down there and it really had a big impact on her and she's a professor of architecture at um, Otis uh, Otis yeah in a uh, in Los Angeles. And, um, yeah. And yeah. that was, uh, really interesting reading it in the context of, you know, uh, being your brother and knowing, you know, the divorce was really painful. And that was something that you were kind of, uh, working through. And, and, and I think the pocket guide to revolution was incredible in the context of, you know, a personal revolution yeah. and you were sort of, uh, all the pun intended an open book about it. And, you know, I, I can really relate with that. And I think that's really part and parcel to what the core of the show is around humanizing success and success is a, a very broad term. I, I, I think yeah. there's many dimensions to it. And I think yeah. the core of it is just to be, you know, uh, to be whole physically, emotionally, spiritually whole. Oh, I love that. Uh, yeah. Love that. Yeah. And yeah. The, uh, yeah. And I was going to say that, you know, I had gone through, similar uh journeys um you know in you know in, 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 and i can so to, totally relate um to to some of the stuff that that you are going through um and i i just so uh you know was so proud of you and and uh, was inspired by you and i think that's probably a great segue into the one of the things that we really wanted to talk about or this idea mm -hmm. of cultural production mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. you were the one that kind of hit me to this whole Fluxus movement out of the 60s, out of the new school. And I wanted to, you know, we've been talking so much about that and, and kind of mm -hmm. how I even let off the, the podcast, like talking about how, like, even this thing that I'm doing is sort of a, a quasi art project, you know, mm -hmm. in, in a way. And, and, mm -hmm. and we're, we're uh, I guess maybe we just kind of step back and, um, mm -hmm. You know, I'm looking here at my screen and I have a definition of what is art and the, the internet says art is a visual object or experience intentionally created through the expression of skill or imagination. It could also be considered the process or product of deliberately ar arranging elements in a way that appeals to the senses or emotions. And as I was reading that, I was I was intrigued that it was interesting that there was an absence of the mind in that definition. Oh, of art. Talk dirty to me. <laughs> so I think that's probably a good setup uh, to talk about cultural production and, and, and yeah. this whole trip on subject object and all that. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Let me, let me back up a little bit. I think that's a great, I think that's a great pointing. And I'm just going to say sort of the shyness around the book, my, my sort of hesitation to, yeah. to really sell that is it feels old, it feels a little stale, and, and it was very, very uh, disclosing. And I remember meeting with Laura and feeling like, kind of terrified that somebody I did not know had such an amazing view into me. And even now, my heart, I feel really tender and it feels a little bit uncomfortable. Um, yeah, well, but, that's art, right? Yeah, yeah, and I think that that's, that's part of it. And then, but, but an interesting sort of, to, to sort of weave it even further in, like I said, the slow boil about my career, um, that through all of that process, I was like, I was, I was working in the creative space. That book was profoundly creative. I was, I was doing language learning. I had been in education before. And just like you described when I was, when I sort of landed on language learning, I was, it was language curriculum design that I was really interested in. And, and it was language curriculum design that felt to me like it brought together, it integrated a cosmopolitan sort of worldly outlook and access to the world with my professional experience in education, uh, with my creative expression and this sort of desire to be wild and in the world, right? Wild and in the world and able to, able to articulate very clearly going into language instruction, like you can talk about every aspect of how people interact and what those dynamics are kind of like ontologies of experience about where you might find um, 
like you, you get purchase, you get language around all of these different kinds of experiences that humans have. So, so that, and, and that process of language learning and going into this field has blossomed exactly in the way that you're describing. I'm trying to kind of weave back to what you were saying. Uh, so what we're doing now before kind of before jumping into that, I'll say to sort of situate what we're doing uh, at castles, we make we're making mixed reality experiences for language learning. We're trying to make these like really vivid, wild, highly contextualized scenarios that people get to to kind of dance through together. And there's a profound sense of like the an aesthetic quality to that. And, and my colleagues have been doing that work around play and games and this sort of functional approach to linguistics for a really long time. But I think what I brought into the process was like driving very hard into the aesthetic dimensions, right? And really saying like, yeah, like Julie, our director had been focused on researching games as a, as a site of learning people people were learning language in game sure. spaces and yeah. nobody was researching that and she's like this is interesting right because here you have this you have this artistic medium of a game and you have language learners who are choosing a server or may, you know maybe or yeah we're, and we're in this context you're talking video games right video games yeah, yeah. i mean yeah initially but but now this is really yeah. awesome and people are studying all kinds of games but but games are an amazing site for um, for practicing for using language, and then there's fan fiction and all of this stuff. So here's where we're starting to get into this sort of territory of cultural production, into the into the aesthetic dimension, and coming back to like what I was saying with like my relationship with my colleagues and what I was really driving towards um, was like I started playing. Like we research play. Like the the main things that we focus on play platforms like media environments media ecologies and um and uh language functional linguistics pragmatics play pra platforms and pragmatics and pragmatics are where it's a it's a field of linguistics and it's where language and culture intersect mm. so we can unpack that a little bit more. yeah and then that's and that's what the artist does they sort of they derail and they, they, the double entendre and the meanings yeah. and there's so much we want to get into and, yeah. and kind of in, in the setup, uh, when we were kind of talking, uh, um, just real quickly, uh, highlight the ICC experience. What, what's that all about? And then we can get into this, this kind of double click into this, uh, yeah. you know, fluxus thing. Yeah. So the ICC experience is ICC stands for intercultural community. ICC stands for Intercultural Communicative Competence. And what we've done is we've created a mixed reality experience. And this is, I mentioned this with the Fulbright uh, experience. So Fulbright mm -hmm. had been using this, the, the Fulbright yeah. grantees all played this game that we make and it, it highlights four uh, key pragmatic dimensions. And they are, I don't have them, hold on. Yeah, Liza, we could cut right here and he can, when, when you cut right before he says, hold on. And then when he's going to go into it, you can roll back in. Okay. So the ICC experience focuses on four key pragmatic dimensions or, or communicative dimensions that hinge on culture mm -hmm. where, where meaning is not at the word level or the sentence level, but the meaning is somehow further out. And the dimensions are power, social distance, uh, rank of imposition, like how imposing is what you're asking for or trying to achieve, and politeness. And so people play through this, this experience where they're uh, stranded on a, a, a planet that's light years away and there's a, a field notebook left from a, an explorer who was there who articulates the fact that there are these four different groups of biromoxia who don't interact with each other well, even though they, they speak the same language, they have kind of different cultural heritage. Uh, each, each of the group has a different cultural heritage. And so they can't, they can't communicate well to each, with each other. And there's all this and conflict. Who, who, between and who is biromoxia? Uh, Byram was a, so biromoxia is, is the name of the planet. 
but it's, yeah. it's sort of we're riffing on this yeah, other cultural theorist named uh, Byram. And Byram are, you guys, has, are you guys pro Byram or anti Byram? Oh, we're chiding Byram. We're, yeah. we're, 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 you guys are kind of poking at Byram, poking the Byram. Yeah, we're, 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 we're trying to, es we're, we're escaping from Byramoxia. We want, oh, yeah, we want yeah. to think of a more sort of nuanced, more dynamic, more uh, systems based approach to negotiating communication and language than what, uh, what Byram is, is presenting. Well, and Byram Moxia was an academic and what was his framework that you guys are disagreeing with? Not you, not useful. Uh, not, not my, not my territory. Okay. Not your territory. Okay. So the ICC experience is, is this, uh, this game that you guys are developing and that's, that's, then that's the mechanism that that's connected to the Fulbright. That right. was our first introduction to yeah. Fulbright. So I've led this experience. I'm, I'm like mm -hmm. the host. We have this alien back, this spaceship yeah. background behind and led the experience mm -hmm. with the State Department on the call. And, and what, what this experience really frames is it, it helps frame understanding cultural expectations related to communicative choices, right? Like, so how, do, how does culture insinuate itself into communication and the choices we make in communication? Sure recognizing individual and team communication preferences. Yep. So like I, I like to have a uh, low formality because in, in informal situations, it minimizes distance, but some, in some contexts you, you, you can't minimize distance. You want to have a higher formality, right? So, so these kinds of things, um, then overcoming like communication blunders that are related to, uh, cultural preferences, and improving, obviously, improving collaboration and decision making, um, activating speed and effectiveness across international teams and contexts by like really calling out and helping people understand how cultural dispositions influence cross cultural communication. Yeah, this is amazing. I mean, not to get too Pollyanna, but is it is, is the nth degree of this, you know, a, a, a framework of strategic communication for world peace. You took the words right out of my mouth. Yeah, I mean that's sort of what occurs to me about what what this is, you know, could lead to. Um, yeah, that, that's beautiful. I guess. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I guess maybe there's some people in the State Department that would also, you know, I don't know if this is fair to say, but an asterisk that as long as the United States is, uh, you know, <laughs> not compromised, which yeah. you know, I think that's probably as a U yeah. U.S. citizen. Uh, interesting. That's a whole nother discussion, but yeah, yeah. Yeah. So let's jump in on your, on your kind of pointing at um, cultural production. And I want to, I want to do a little, I want to do a little pivot. I'm going to yeah. co-create co -create here and, and we're going to demonstrate a little trust. And I want to, I do want to turn slightly away from cultural production. Yeah. You mentioned the state department. I think it's an interesting place to point out like, you know, the difference between soft power and hard power. Are you familiar I with that? I do not. I know so the hard, difference between uh, soft porn and hard porn, though. <laughs> okay, so so hard power are things like like governance, money, you know, like being able to just like throw your weight into it and say this sure. is what's going to happen. To engineer, right? To engineer something is hard power. Yeah. Uh, soft power is like um, cultural influence, um, uh, co contextual awareness, um, things that things that will allow. Um, a context to, 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 to lean in a direction more, more gently. And the mm -hmm. Fulbright program itself is an example of, even though it's within the United States government, which, which you know, exercises plenty of hard power, uh, just descriptively, that's not a criticism, but like there's, there is all, all of that money and governance yeah. and all of that's happening. But, yeah. um, but the Fulbright program itself, when you think about like the state, the U.S. State Department is saying, hey, Let's let's connect with as many countries are interested in participating with us and draw scholars from your country to our country mm -hmm. for a cultural exchange. And then our country will send scholars to, to your countries. Right. And that's like that's an example of soft power, like a beautiful example of soft power. So so as I've been thinking about and as we've been talking about this conversation, there's been something uncomfortable inside of me thinking about cultural production like two maybe two or three things one of them is um i'm much more interested and i think capable of kind of speaking in the direction of soft power than hard power and and so i want to move from 
cultural production to cultural enrichment. Mm -hmm. Right. So because you're, you're describing more around the effect you're trying to create and it's more active versus a, a abstraction that could be, uh, you know, um, I don't know. The what the word comes to mind is abused, but it's it's sort of it. it you're this is interesting context. Like, how would you make? I mean, just out of curiosity, academically, like how would that distinction that you're making by that subtle change? What what's that called? Mm, okay. Well, the second point is the metaphor. Yeah. Right. The this is the, here's the answer to that question. Yeah. Part number two is the metaphor, which is. Uh, when we think of production, this is an answer to your question. When I think of production, two things come to mind. I think of like industrial mechanical production. Sure. And I think of uh, like the commercial dimensions, right? So like like the, the actual means of production, like the, the machinery, and then the yeah. framework that we think about it in terms of yeah. like trying yeah, to Yeah, that could also be a, com a commercial dim dimension, gross domestic product. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Totally. So, so, so enrichment, I, I, uh, generally speaking, do my best to use ecological metaphors. Mm. I'm not, I, I don't like metaphors where the, the thing that you're presenting as the, as the reference in the metaphor is like man-made mm. made by humans because we are already getting a, a layer away from something that feels more fundamental e ecology you know it's this very slow process um and so thinking about enriching a space um is something that i can i can feel much more comfortable speaking to and then kind of the third part is like i'm i'm not interested in, in part because i'm not interested in giving the powerful more power giving the hard powerful more power i'm interested in people becoming more contextually aware I'm interested in people um, becoming more sensitive, becoming more um, supple and able to negotiate the dynamics, right? So cultural sure. en enrichment feels like the kind of thing that, that opens up talking about the dynamics and then the idea of being able to talk about this metaphor and the, and the, the ecological, my ecological bias. Um, so, and I mean, like a really good example of this, that's like very grounded is um, when you think of the word, I think of the, this word tilth, T-I-L-T-H. And tilth is the, is the quality of soil. And I was just watching a video online, I think it's called Carbon Cowboys, and it's these farmers who are talking about kind of moving from conventional farming practice to more ecological, more biodynamic. This is rooted in Duke's soil is life, right? We're referencing Duke's stump uh, episode 50 and he has these great metaphors and principles. Yeah. So soil is life. They, these in carbon cowboys, they were talking about their uh, parents and grandparents where the, the chemical companies came out to the farm and gave them fertilizer, which they'd never seen before in, in, these, in these industrial forms. And they told them, put this on your crops. And all of their crops just totally shot up and all of the farmers just rushed in and said, we need this, right? Mm -hmm. But yeah. this is now saw, a generation- they saw, they saw dollar signs and probably ease of, e easier, less work. Production. Yeah. More production, right? And so what's happened as a result of that and what they were talking about in this film was that then you have to till, right? And then you spray herbicides and you end up with monoculture and you're yeah. growing one thing. And then the topsoil gets degraded and it's no longer and the tilth, the quality of the tilth is totally degraded. It's not alive. It's no mm. longer alive. And when it rains, the water doesn't hold the moisture. It, it, it erodes. It pulls off and the topsoil goes away. Um, but when you have tilthy soil, when you enrich, when you think about it ecologically and you say, yeah, okay, you pump that fertilizer in and it's going to grow totally. But there are some downstream consequences that <clears throat> weren't, they weren't aware of, right? Yeah, yeah. So, they're second and third order costs. Exactly. They are exactly. Pro probably more expensive than the uh, cost of just doing it the, the primary exactly. way. Exactly. Yeah. So this is so. Here's an ecological metaphor that helps us understand this this dynamic in soil, but but that and the way that that hinges on the idea of production, 
Mm. Right. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, when I worked for Jack Dangerman at Esri, he grew up uh, first generation American immigrant. Um, his he grew up. His dad was they had a gardener, and they started a nursery. And he would always take that approach of it. You know, you start with a seed and yeah. you take care of it, tend it, and uh, he would have a very ecological uh, perspective around you know even how do you grow a business or a community yep. or a network yep. and yep. you know it's, yep. it's and that's duke's uh duke stump has that idea of like one mind at a time yeah you know? yeah and yeah that's so yeah so here i can talk i feel very capable and 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 have a my spirit feels free to talk about the dynamics of cultural enrichment um mm -hmm. and and you mentioned some people when as we've been thinking about you know like yeah. what, how exactly are we gonna move through these topics, you mentioned some people who actually could speak much more articulately to cultural production, being artists doing cultural production and ha have a much clearer sense of uh, the labor that's involved in that. And what we're going to, I think what we can do is, is, is talk more about the, the space and the dimensions of uh, enrichment versus degradation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's fair. Well, I mean, one of the things that comes to mind is this idea that I really enjoyed chatting with you about uh, kind of from a historical point of view is pressing rewind back to Descartes. Mm -hmm. And it, maybe would that be a, a, maybe a good place to give some context around, you know, this. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the question is how to, how to dig into this. We could talk about Descartes and how he mapped this old tradition from Euclid and Pythagoras in geometry onto a coordinate plane. And that's the X, Y axis. And now we think mm -hmm. about X, Y, Z mm -hmm. axis. So mm -hmm. whenever anybody's yeah. talking about polygons and high poly yeah. or low poly yeah. spaces, this is all literally downstream of, of a thought space that Descartes opened by mapping geometry into algebra. Um, and I would, I would sort of generally point all of that in the direction of kind of put a, put a, a bow around all of that and call it a computational theory of mind, um, which is rooted in that Cartesian s sense of subjectivity that we've talked about, like that there's a distinction between the object and the subject. And mm -hmm. this is a dualistic frame of mind. Right, that that mind, that mind is not present in the object. It is only present in the subject. Uh, and there, are, I mean, this is like these are gross overgeneralizations, but this is the broad contour of the sort of historical development mm -hmm. of of the computational theory of mind. And and uh, more and more, there are people saying that that's not the whole picture um the math and the and the and the analytical approach are incredibly powerful and we see the power of all of that computation happening and all of the concerns that people have about ai and the way that the world is the acceleration of technology and change all of that stuff really has to do with the power of that computational space of the cartesian um thought space and this is really really connected all of this roots really deeply yeah. into was taken up by newton and the and the um and the classical model of physics right that's that's this whole side is like really anchored on all of that and the and the critique that's kind of growing is to say more and more that 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 dualistic approach that separation between the object and the subject is really problematic it, it, it but it's it's powerful it's not that it's not true but it, it creates some problems and you already mentioned like first order consequences and second order and third order consequences i think that the easiest way to describe it is to say that the that kind of thinking makes it very easy to focus on first order consequences sure right. yeah yeah it, 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 there's an absence of externalities you know when you have a exxon valdez crisis or the horizon oil spill it's actually net positive well it's it's a it's a boost in gdp yeah 
Yeah, it, yeah. it creates more uh, economic output and it doesn't factor in the economic or ecological damage. Exactly. So that yeah. word back to ecology. So on yeah. the other side, then on the other side, what the, the critique in one way, it's a new critique that's emerging. And in another way, it's like an older tradition, the non-dualistic tradition, the more ecological tradition that's saying something like um, uh, th all of that activity uh, in the computational space for me maps to the kind of the prefrontal cortex it's like really mm -hmm. analytical uh, space and and we we have a tradition you can see this you can see that bearing down in those of us those of you listening who think that thought is something that happens in your brain this is where this kind of thinking goes that that consciousness is in the brain yeah well now now I'm, i've become uh really avid listening to andrew huberman uh online on the podcast leading uh neuroscientist at stanford and i think he's connected up to the uh academic that you're a big fan of which is um, dan siegel yeah, yeah. Siegel. and uh and it's this and he andrew is repeatedly talking about that the mind is extended into, into the all the different organs in the body and down to the spine and it's it's yeah a, yeah it's it, it's it's not a yeah. it's an integration between yeah. the body and the mind i think yeah. the other thing is is i, I kind of just thinking like so descartes said i we i think therefore i am like are you are you pretty certain that 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 that, that his in when he said that that he meant the mind and there was an there was like it there's a total absence of feeling in that thought uh, it's such a good question. We talked about this before and I kind of, I push it aside, just like, let's, yeah. let's not go there. There, There's a lot, I, I think my personal belief is that Descartes was not as dualistic and sort of Cartesian as history has painted him to be. Yeah. I have a book, I can't remember who the author is, but there's something, it is a book, it's something like Consciousness and the Brain. And I started reading the first couple pages and he's talking about Descartes and uh, he said something about Descartes' belief that there were hydraulic forces and that in the morning the hydraulic forces surge upwards and that that's what wakes us up and he's like oh this is bullshit you know like this is bogus but when i was reading i wanted to throw the book across the room as soon as i was reading him discount that because i think that descartes was when i read descartes saying that there's a there's a hydraulic pressure that comes up into the brain what is required to have that kind of insight that well, I wake up in the morning because there's pressure rising up into my mind, incredible subtlety, right? Yeah. And I yeah, think that a actually, lot of whatever, four or 500 years ago, right? Totally, totally. Yeah. And when you think about like Chinese medicine, this is like, this is not far, I think from the account of Chinese medicine, there's chi and there's fluid and the way that the, the relationship between the plasma and the blood and the flow of electricity, all of these things. I think that through the enlightenment um, and the Renaissance, I think that those humans were incredibly attuned, but they did not have the kind of sophisticated language that we have. So they had to be more coarse in their description of what was going on. Yeah, now we can cool. talk about the gravitational yeah. field. We mm -hmm. can talk about electromagnetism yeah. and they wanted to talk about ether and that was very problematic and people kept mm -hmm. sh shutting that down. But I think that there, I think that, yes, I think that he was actually not as, uh, black and white about it, but, yeah. but we can't really, I mean, this is like, this is a conversation for, yeah. One of the things, I mean, I guess it's kind of still trying to pull that thread on art because art seems yeah. like back to that definition. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it, this is it, it, like, this is something I would love to talk to Andrew Huberman about is like, fundamentally, are we irrational? Like, is that, the, is that like the, uh, what do they call that? The, there's some kind of uh, state. There's like the, um, they talk a lot about this in the psychedelic world, like, uh, the fundamental state, the primary state or something. Oh, the default uh, mode network. Default mode network is the default mode, just emotions. And then it's the, the mind that I, I don't, I don't know. Maybe, yeah. I, I don't know if you want to talk about this, but I, and I think I do want to pull the thread back to art and how art yeah. helps us yeah. to 
yeah. interface with yeah. this, par- yeah. this these uh, dimensions. Yeah, 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 totally. Okay, so so I'll just point out, I mean, this is the power of language to me. You ask, are we fundamentally irrational? There's a kind of binary embedded in that sure. question. Yeah, there's no gradient. There's It's vector. There's no, uh, ra- no raster or no... Uh, It's yeah. So uh, are we fundamentally irrational? I think that there are parts of us that are profoundly irrational and that the rational parts of us have an incredibly difficult time wrapping our rational minds around. Um, But I think that we're also rational. I mean, we can do that, you know, Um, where where my pause in talking about we we, let's get we I think we'll make one more sort of philosophical move and then we can get right into the heart of the question of art. Sure. So. So on the so there's the computation on the one side, and then and then the the theory of the extended mind on the other. And the theory of the extended mind says that yes, the head is definitely doing something. There's something in the brain that's incredibly important to all of this. But also the nerves are in the heart and around the heart, and also the nerves are in and around the gut. And if you look at the development of the nervous system, it starts in the gut. The oldest structures start in the gut, and they move up and the flower of the mind blossoms, right? So we've got hands and bodies and emotions and the world, and we think with all of these things. We think socially, you know? Cognition is not something that's constrained. This is my, this is the, the, from the ecological perspective, from the extended theory of mind perspective, cognition is a distributed process. Love that. Right, so, so here's where this, I think it would make a little pivot and this gets really interesting. So all of that computational stuff is rooted in the experimental paradigm, which I affirm is an incredibly powerful thing. But the problem with the experimental paradigm is there's a little bit of a crisis of ecological validity. Because in order to, ex- to experiment in a laboratory context, what you need to do is you need to decontextualize everything and isolate these variables to be able to have a yeah. very clear understanding of like what exactly is this medicine doing? yeah and the environment's too complex to, the environment's too complex to control that's exactly right the environment's yeah. too complex to control and the kinds of reason that work really well in that space are induction and deduction mm-hmm. right where you start where you start with uh, some information and you move towards a general principle or you start with, I can never remember what they are, but, but both of those two induction and deduction function very well in the experimental paradigm. And, and the question about art that's getting really interesting to me is that there's a whole, uh, wave of pragmatist philosophers who fit more on this extended mind side. And the pragmatist paradigm, and we we do, I said uh, pragmatics, language pragmatics, comes from the the pragmatist tradition of of William James and John Dewey and Charles Saunders Peirce. And and the, the kind of reason, so induction, deduction, there's another kind of reason, and it's called abduction. And abduction says, We want to understand, given the current state of affairs, without the ability to like take a smoke break and do some research about what the best next choice is based on some kind of, you know, uh, empirical data, we want to make a, a, a decision about how to move forward given the information that we have access to within the reasonable amount of time that we that we can that we can act. So in abduction, what you want to do is you want to um, you 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 take stock of the current state of affairs, and then you do what my mentor Jerry Burke, the political scientist here at the U of O, uh, talks about. He's always encouraging me as here as a strategist to think about making pragmatic experiments, and and this is an abductive practice to say. You know, we're working on this project. We're interested in seeing what's possible. Um, and instead of saying what the outcome is that we want to see, we'll make some bets. And we'll say, we're going to devote 30% of our energy to, to this potential trajectory. And we're going to devote another percentage of our 
energy to this trajectory and another percent to this trajectory, right? And then we're gonna run those experiments out. Like you're talking about Jack, we're gonna, you know, Jack Dangerman, we're gonna plant these different plants and we're gonna see which of them does yeah. the best. Yeah, I'm looking online. It says the in Stanford site, uh, Stanford.edu abduction. Uh, no, abduction is often often called the inference to the best explanation. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a kind of dynamism involved. Like mm -hmm. the scene is active, mm -hmm. right? And you've got to you've got to move. And so it's not like the absolute right or wrong. It's yeah. like the what can what what's the best we can do with the stuff that we've got at the moment. Yeah, yeah. Jack Dangerman has that beautiful insight around uh, above the line, where context yeah. is above the line and content is below the line, and content is sort of that glue of the animal, you know, the 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 uh, stimulus response function, where where above the line is the imagination, the creativity, and the probably the insight and maybe that back to abduction would be that, that, you know, using the inference or the best explanation where you're kind of using, uh, uh, additional, there, there's a kind of, a the, the art of science. There's a technique. Yeah, there you go. Okay. Yeah, totally. Yeah. So this is where, so this wave of pragmatist philosophers are, are literally saying the, the art of science or the art of life. And what happens, I think, in that in that computational space, and what we're trained in an industrial educational model to get the answer right, because the mm -hmm. computation, I mean, like one plus one has like a right yeah. answer. Yeah. And, and we're trained to perform that kind of yeah. that kind of knowledge. Yeah. Right? Well, I, I was I was just listening to um, Rick Rubin's podcast and he had Mark Andreessen on it and it just came out this week and I was listening to this morning, walking the dog and it was the most mind blowing thing that Andreessen says, who, by the way, brought the, you know, and wrote the mosaic the internet browser yeah. and knows a thing or two about this stuff Yeah. and said that um, as early as three years ago, they would have put him in the loony bin if he went public that the computer could generate a wrong answer which is what an ai hallucinates yeah because basically you know but prior the framework was cartesian and it was like binary and it yeah. couldn't the computer couldn't give a wrong answer but now yeah. with yeah. modeling the mind and the neural network it can have conviction of an answer that sounds compelling and in fact it's a hallucination there was a recent um, uh, law uh, uh, legal issue that happened where um, uh, a, a, a lawyer used the GPT to build his case and reference some legal precedent that was manufactured and not true. And the smart judge cross-checked it, figured it out, and asked the lawyer if he had used a GPT. And yeah. the lawyer said yes, and the judge said, "Don't ever do it again because you can be disbarred for wow. presenting a fake precedent." Yeah, and wow. so here we are at the dawn. Like this AI trip is wild because now the computer has gone off the reservation and is now able to uh, create an invent and have context back to mm -hmm. the it's of the computers above the line now. Kind of. It's yeah. it's using context to generate sort of probabilistic answers. But I think the point you're making is totally right. And yeah. I think it really connects back to this narrative that I'm, I'm kind of delivering around the computational versus the, um, the extended. And the computational, like I said, it's really rooted in the Newtonian model. And so there's a really profound sense of linearity, right? And what you're describing has to do with the nonlinearity of thought. Like yes. thought is actually really loopy. Like we're really everybody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They call it, he calls it like yeah, even computer they call it fuzzy logic. You know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so like the I mean a technical word for it is tautologies. Like you just have these nested meanings, and you have these like nests of nested meanings, and it, the question ends up being, and this is like really abductive. It's like is that nest of meanings something that we could lay eggs in and like have a family in? And there's mm -hmm. like not a right. There's no like yes or no about that. There's no binary mm -hmm. about it. Yeah. Right. So. Yeah. So, okay. So this is the space that's emerging and this is why the computational stuff is becoming more and more problematic, mm -hmm. especially in light of, like I mentioned, a, a kind of industrial educational model. 
a factory educational model. Mm -hmm. So the world is getting more complex, it's getting more dynamic, and the questions emerging are like, in oh wow like it's incredibly non-linear life is non-linear and the like rightness and wrongness of things has a lot to do with cultural preference like we described before in in the icc experience so how do we negotiate that stuff right and the answer to that question how do we negotiate it is not to throttle computational power because like now you get the AI, like you, you still end up with those problems because the, the reason that the AI drifts is because in that sort of normative curve, it's yeah. able to answer questions that, that are like really, um, uh, where there are examples that are readily available and the, and the hallucinations come on the, on the periphery, mm -hmm. right? So what we need as, as, as thinking beings in our own right, then all of these philosophers, and I could list you know, I could, Alva Noe is a huge, I'm reading a new book of his called The Entanglement, like art and philosophy and, and why they matter. Uh, he wrote a fantastic book called Strange Tools about uh, the parallel projects of art and science. Um, a, a prag he's a pragmatist philosopher. There's Richard Schusterman, who's written a bunch about soma aesthetics. And soma means mind hyphen body, right? Yeah. So the aesthetic dimension of human experience. So the answer to the question of like, well, what do we do? How does this relate to art? We become more sensitive. We become more dynamic. We we have this incredible capacity to process information, and we do it in ways that we absolutely cannot understand, right? And then the answer. So what do we do? We train our senses to be as sophisticated as we can. We 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 have a greater concern about the affective dimension like I've mentioned before to you, like affective, like the mood. And we think about ambiance and the way that the environment comes in and, and causes, you know, like the fact that we're recording in this space is affecting the conversation, right? And becoming more aware of the way that context, um, the way that, that content is contingent on context. Right. And that, and that yeah, is a profoundly... and then the, the, the other conceit around that is uh, content and form. Right. Yeah, totally. Yeah. yeah. Totally. And so well, here's think, where the artist comes in. Yeah. Here's this, the, the gets into the heart of the art. Yeah, that's exactly right. So then what does the artist do? You know, the artist says, uh, or, or projects or models or exemplifies, um, how, uh, how the world is or how the world could be. Um, and I think that, yeah, coming back to the, the shift that I wanted to make from production to enrichment, uh, for me, it's important to say, like, you could make art, so to speak, something that people call art, that's really propaganda, you know, and, yeah. and that's hard power co-opting a sort of aesthetic dimension and trying to, to push into a cultural space and say, like, this is a version of reality that we want to, to happen. And here's like the psyops and all of that stuff, which is very crafty, you know, like in a technical sense uh, and creative, but it's really, it's not, it doesn't move towards enrichment for the, for the greater good. It might move towards mm -hmm. the enrichment of some, um, but to me that's problematic. So the question about how do we, uh, how do we do the enrichment? Where does the enrichment come from? It's, it's getting more sensitive. It's being more subtle. It's being attuned to, to dynamics, dynamism. Mm -hmm. And, and the, the relevance of context, like first order, second order, third order context on the outcomes that we want to see and not being so concerned with uh, getting the first order consequence that we want, but, but enriching and being able to extend that uh, sort of the substrate, to enrich the substrate, to enrich the the container yeah what comes to mind is in the art is, is back to that definition i read where it, it talks about you know trying to impact and here i'll read it again what is art uh the second part it could also be considered a process or product of deliberately arranging elements in a way that appeals to the senses or emotions yeah um, and this is where fluxus comes in so talk to us about Fluxus. What what was it? Who was involved? And how is it? How did it get your attention? And, and mm -hmm, mm -hmm. all that sort of mm -hmm. thing. 
All right, so to kind of put a little, a little bit of a definition around it, Fluxus, I think, highlights two things. One, it, it messes with the subjectivity positioning of the relate in the relationship between the art slash artist and mm -hmm. the and the viewer. So instead of like having an object on the wall that the artist has made as a genius and is presenting and it's the mm -hmm. it's the audience's yeah. job to receive, Fluxus kind of turns that on its head and, and insists, and many other artists and art uh, traditions in art have, have have are playing this game, but Fluxus is particularly interesting to me for reasons we'll get into yeah, in a second. Yeah, and you mentioned one of the most famous Fluxus artists was uh, John Lennon's second wife, Yoko Ono, and she told me about that story. She had the smile box. Talk, what, tell me about the smile box. So the smile box is a, it's a, a, little, a little box, and it has a little hinge, and it opens, and it says smile box on the outside. And when you open the smile box, what you see inside is a mirror. And so if you're, if you're holding the box and you open it, it's positioned in a way to reflect your mouth right back to you. Right? Yeah, and that's and fluxus. That, where the, that's the, the fluxus. Art, the subject and the object, it, there's a dynamic. Yeah. yeah, that's a great example of that. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. The, the subjectivity positioning gets, gets mixed up. And that's an mm. excellent example of that. Yeah. And then well, the other- to, to catch our audience up, how would you as a linguist define subject versus object? What is that relationship? I know it's pretty obvious, but I just to, just to show that we're. <laughs> if it's obvious to you, tell me because I I'm stumped. I'm not sure. Yeah, I well, can think I about think, it for a while. I mean, I think the subject is like me, and you're the object. I'm looking at you. <laughs> you know, okay. or maybe you're the subject and I'm the object. If you, from your point of view, I mean, yeah. isn't that the the classic kind of thing? I think, yeah, I mean, that's how, yeah, I mean, in, in a, a way, I mean, what comes to mind when you say that? And, and, and yeah, if you look back, it's like my perspective is sort of subjective. It's my perspective. It's what yeah. I believe. But then there's like an objective perspective, which would be not me. It's somebody looking back at me that has more objectivity. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, I, I mean, what, what comes to mind is like the, the objectification of women is like a, a phrase that you hear. Yeah, right? yeah. Yeah. And, and that's a, there's an example of like that this person yeah. has no, there's no person about them. What, what the, what the subject is interested in is the, is the object of their desire, right? Yeah. It's not about the person, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's um, interesting. And then I, the, yeah, that's uh, the, the other, one other little bit is there's this idea of the third position, which would be like the God view or like the, the whoever, you know, the creator or whatever you believe in that there's a third position that kind of sees both the subject and the object. Yeah, I think that that's hard. Here, I'm at my, I'm in my office and having, I don't know about that. It's a hard position to defend, yeah. I think, because what yeah. is the, what is their, what, how is their perceptual system tuned such that they're able to do that? The, the third position to me that that I've mentioned to you before is the is the middle voice. Yeah, it's yeah. This space in between, in between uh, the direct object and the indirect object. So in the direct object, you have uh, a subject acting upon an object, and in the indirect object, so like so like uh, I'm hitting a golf ball, and in the indirect object, uh, the the object is acting on the subject. The 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 golf ball hit me. Right, uh, but in the in the middle voice, what you have is you have this space in between that says the conditions were such that as I teed up, and this other person hit their ball, and the wind was going in just such a way that when I, you know, stepped up to the ball, like then, you know, it it landed on me. Um, and, th and there's a, you can see that there's this sort of broader contextualizing that's happening. And in English, the middle voice is, is difficult to achieve because our grammar doesn't, doesn't give it to us. What uh, languages have a more fluent middle voice? You know, I know that Latin does. I'm not sure what others do. But the person who's writing a bunch about this is a woman named Jane Bennett. She's a, a political theorist uh, at Johns Hopkins. She's written a book called um, Vibrant Matter. And she's in a, in a group of people that are identified kind of they're, they're under the banner of the new materialists. And, and new materialists want to talk about 
um, affect and mood and ambiance and the way that the way that the environment flows into and causes certain things to happen and the fact that it's flown flowed into and caused certain things to happen causes certain things to flow out and that yeah. those are recursive relational yeah. processes yes and so yeah that reminds me of duke stump's insight you can't create the magic but you can create the conditions for the magic that, yeah totally totally yeah. Yeah. I love that. You know, and kind of back to Fluxus, you know, in this kind of third position, like, you know, depending on what, you know, I believe in God. Could could uh, could uh, our experience on this, you know, I believe God created Earth. I don't know what, I don't really know what more than that to say. I'm just going to leave it at that. But could, let's say somebody does believe in God, either as a God, God created Earth, and we're on this god earth experience could our experience be fluxus that we're interfacing with almost like a mirror box i yeah. don't know i think yeah i mean i think that that's the uh let's see but maybe we're but but maybe in that kind of doing that thought experience that's so subjective though because there's some people that totally believe in that and they're so over like i don't know maybe you see that when like you know, like we had a crazy sunset last night and everybody was posting all these photos of sunsets on Instagram. And maybe that's evidence that, you know, hey, there's whatever that is that's created that. Well, now we're interface, we're, we're, there's a subject object interface. Or how about coming back to the middle voice and saying, like get, getting rid of the subject object distinction and saying that there's a confluence of events and we're in awe. You know, and our awe and our state of wonder at the world that that evolved us. And I'm not I'm not denying God. I, I think yes, I, I I do think that there's something like that. But I but the fact we we have such a history, we have such a burden of language about God and and God and and projecting yeah. Yes. projecting our own yes. personality, the contours of our being into this other being to yeah, have yeah. an anthropomorphic idea of what God is. Sure. God is yeah, yeah. so yeah, far we, beyond that. But yeah. I think I think that God is something like the middle voice. And it's something like it's something like, you know, sunsets. And this this gets to back to the second point of fluxus, which is uh either entirely collapsing or at least bringing closer together art and life yes and so here when you look at a sunset when you look at a sunset you're not like what are you looking at you're looking at the sun and the atmosphere but 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 if you if you think about it in deep time and you think about the fact that we evolved because of all of these intensely connected, interconnected relational processes with no externalities. And then we can look out. I mean, this is like Alan Watts, like we're the universe reflecting on itself. Yes. In a state of wonder about the mm -hmm. fact that, yeah. that we have the privilege to perceive the sun that I believe has something to do with us evolutionarily becoming more upright you know yeah. like we went from from being on all fours and bent at the hips to coming up and the sun has something to do with the the structure of our body and and the eyes and the fact that the, the nervous system runs on photons you know and the photons come into us in part through our eyes you know, yeah, like yeah. Body, well, yeah, 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 yeah. And Andrew Huberman talks a lot about that. And I've been doing his protocol of getting up in the morning and getting the sun and getting the, yeah, you know, yeah. sun in the eyes, and it's yeah. really yeah. helping my sleep. Yeah, and I think yeah. that's being more whole and ecological. Bingo. So I think back to fluxes. So I'm reading the definition. It was an international, interdisciplinary community of artists, composers, designers, and poets during the 1960s and 70s who engaged in experimental art performances, which emphasized the artistic process over the finished product. product. Yeah, right. So here, oh. now you can see yeah. why this is something that's interesting to me. Uh, I'll tell you the origin story, which I think is helpful. But before I tell you the origin story, I think it's exactly in that in that processual dynamic and that dimension. I'm interested as an applied linguist in fluxus because 
even though there are other artists who were playing the exact same game that you just described, Fluxus was a loose collective. And, and they played with collective action. And they played with the collective nature of the creative process and the way that they were able to, as a group, create higher order amongst themselves and develop new forms of art that was possible because they worked kind of like, a, like an organism. Right. So that so structurally, the relationship between the individual and the collective, then there's a nested dynamic that, that's really interesting to me in thinking about in thinking about cultural production, cultural enrichment. Uh, they're, they're playing with a space together and, and sort of exploring the rules of using material and meaning and, and, and what's come before and projecting something that could be new. Right. So so the origin story of Flux is. I think it was 1959 at the New School, the composer, avant-garde composer John Cage, taught a course in composition, right? So he's a, he's a musical composer, but from Parsons and the rest of the New School, the colleges of the New School, come in these art students predominantly, not musicians. And John Cage teaches art students about composition from his sort of, from his point of view. And... Um, what what ended up happening i mean he was already playing this game but because you have all of these artists there i think it like it really why it took off is they they begin one of the kind of free key phrases in, in fluxus terminology is transmedia so they began making these transmedia uh like the, and one example is like the score the fluxus event score so you normally have like a musical score, right? And it's got like this time signature and the bars. And one of my favorite John Cage quotes is that uh, new notions require new forms of notation. So John Cage is really famous for really disrupting and using experimental kinds of notation to make music, right? So he's teaching these artists about this method of composition and, and, and working them, helping them to think about um, minimally specifying, right? Like just saying as little as they possibly could about, about a future direction and, and using media from different, you know, from different disciplines, different kinds of media, ambient media, stuff that was just around, um, and then each other and each other's experiences. So like a Fluxus event score, an example of one is, um, and I wish I could remember who the artist was, but one of my favorites is, uh, the score is draw a line and follow it. And that's written on a card, like a three by five card. And that's the work of art. It's transmedia because it's like, it's a score, which is typically from music, but now this is coming in into social performance, right? So that's advanced as a, as a score. And then the way that what I, like I mentioned about the collective and the way that that's sort of organismic, then people began taking that event score, draw a line and follow it, and they began performing it at Fluxus events. And so one of my favorite examples is somebody, um, in front of an audience uh, on stage, dips his head in a bucket of ink and, and draws on a piece of long piece of butcher paper that he had lined up, drug his head across the butcher paper and, and drew a line and followed it, right? Both, both following the event score as it was written, but also, um, also sort of enacting it and, like, and, and moving it out of the media of, of ink on card into the into yeah. the lived experience yeah so the they're also fluxus often gets talked about in the same breath as dadaism where it's kind of an adjacent thing where mm -hmm. I, I, when i was doing the research on this conversation the, mm -hmm. i think the distinction was that dadaism is am i pronouncing that right yeah dada mm -hmm. yeah dada is uh more just like uh, absurd and yeah. kind of like uh, absurdity where the the Fluxus artists, there was, uh, they were trying to also engage the, uh, the back to the subject object. Yes. Play. They were trying to engage the audience in a new way. Yeah. Yeah. The way I think about this is that I think of, and, and this really maps back to what we've been talking about, like sort of the computational theory of mind is what Dada was exploring in that, in the absurd, Marcel Duchamp's famous quote has to do with, it's something like, you know, is it interesting? 
that's like one of his driving questions is, is it interesting? It doesn't really matter, you know, what the content is. Is it just, is it interesting? And there's an affective dimension there, right? There's an emotional response to that. Um, and, and so they're playing with nonsense, definitely playing with nonsense, back to the question about the non-rational and, and asking, probing the environment and asking the environment, how does the environment participate with us in this interplay between sense and nonsense and what can we learn by experimenting with nonsense or just what's around right so whatever's around and how can what's around what's ambient what's ubiquitous how can it be incorporated into these higher order structures and how do we make meaning right it's it for me fluxus is interesting because i think that they're asking the question they're practically asking the question how do we make meaning Mm -hmm. yeah you know? fair and nonsense and contingency is a huge part of that going mm -hmm. back to abduction there's a state of affairs there are there are environments that we're used to and we perform in them in these really patterned ways and so a lot of the work with fluxus has to do with expanding our notion of the space that's at play i didn't tell you i've never told you this example here's another one uh, another fluxus art piece uh, in, in the category of flux sports, they had a bunch of sports that they, that they created as well. And this one was called flux ping pong. I think that was the name flux ping pong. And, and the ping pong was just like normal ping pong. You got the, the table and the paddles, except for two things. Number one, there's a hole in the paddle, like a pretty sizable hole. And number two, screwed to the paddle is a cup of water like a like a can like a like a like a soup can with the top cut off filled with water and so now you're playing ping pong with a paddle that has a hole in it and a cup of water full of water and so how do you play this freaking game right so it takes this really familiar space of ping pong and the rules and the environment that's at play mm -hmm. and if you play it out and you imagine what's happening you you have a very hard time hitting the ball first of all and second as you as you swing very like you know like trying to be really accurate with the slice of the paddle that, that's available to you not in the middle right on the periphery then then you're as you swing you're sloshing the water around and the water gets on the table and it causes the that light little ball to bounce funny and it gets all over the floor and so you have to start like being really careful about how you're moving so it problematizes like in a really physical way right what is the space of ping pong where normally you can just kind of jump right in and you're in this tiny little groove and they're saying like no 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 the space of playing ping pong is much broader and we and precisely like the the uh the smile box fluxus says we want you to notice the environment in a in a different way mm. right and here's where that subjectivity positioning comes in the the rules of flux ping pong are like that would probably be the event score you know but then but then the participant as you play the game you become aware of this expanded territory this this middle voice space of these confluence of all these events that normally completely go unnoticed because you're just in the groove, you know? Yeah. Love that. And you had mentioned the, uh, Yoko Ono and John Lennon love in, is that, was that a Fluxus, uh, example? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. I mean, that was on their honeymoon. And typically when people go on a honeymoon, they, I mean, this is my recollection. I could somebody, you know, yeah. if we fact check, like maybe, maybe, yeah. maybe this isn't right, but this is my understanding and why I, why I like it and why I think of it as, as fluxus is that instead of going on a, on a luxurious honeymoon, which maybe they did at, at some other point, but, but they, they, they staged like a sit in, which is like a po political form of activism, yeah. but you yeah. know, bed, bed in, bed in, bed yeah. in for peace. That ends for peace. Yeah, they did it at the hotel, Hilton Hotel in Amsterdam, and they did one. Oh, they did a few of them. Uh, Queen Elizabeth Hotel in Montreal. Montreal I, idea is derived from a sit-in, which a group of protests remain seated uh, with an establishment until they are evicted, arrested, or requests. The public proceedings were filmed and later turned into a document documentary called Bed Peace, 
which was made available for free on YouTube in August of 2011 by Yoko Ono. As How is it of, spelled? Peace. P E P E A C E. Yeah. Yeah. Which, but so there's a play on words there because you would like peace, like you could you could have a P I E C E, right? Yeah. 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 As, knowing as and, yeah knowing that. Uh, their 1969 marriage would be a huge press event. Lennon and Oko decided to use pre publicity to promote world peace. They spent their honeymoon, in the presidential suite at the Amsterdam hotel for a week, inviting the world's press into the hotel room every day. So regarding, regarding the fluxus, Yoko is one of the highest profile in that collective. And the, the internet says that, uh, the most commonly cited was Fluxus event was a series of Chamber Street Loft concerts in New York curated by Yoko Ono and Lamont Young in 1969, or excuse me, 1961, featuring pieces by Ono, Jackson, Mac Lowe, Joseph Bird, Henry Flint, the three, the month long Yam Festival held in up New York State, blah, blah, blah. So yeah, she was, you know, what, what, in, what, what intrigues me about that is, you know, John Lennon at that time was arguably the most famous person in the world mm -hmm. and the Bigger most, Jesus. yeah. And, mo and most, uh, respected artists and profound songwriter and profound human. Mm -hmm. And that he would, um, you know, their, their marriage is very, very controversial. A lot of people sort of, you maybe still don't get it. And, mm -hmm. but in this context of fluxus, you know, she probably was a, a muse and uh, really gave him a lot of. Um, Absolutely. Uh, I don't want. I don't know the situation, but I would imagine that he, she would have been so um, kind of. I, the words that come to my mind are intriguing, uh, useful, maybe to help him even process what he was dealing with. But that kind of attention and that subject or object mm -hmm. orientation and. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, yeah. It's, it, it's profound. Yeah. Yeah. And um, to kind of problematize it a little bit more, there are some accounts that, um, so the way that Fluxus was organized, there's another character that they call, he's like, they refer to him in the research as the empresario. And his name was, uh, George Machunius. I think I'm saying his name right. And George Machunius, uh, was like, he, he orchestrated a lot of Fluxus, um, activity uh, the flux kits. He, he had a lot to do with that, organizing that and some publications. And, and he would make these lists of who's in and who's out. And, mm. and, and he would, he, there's a sense of like a little bit, um, like a little bit of a chaotic dimension, a little bit of a dramatic dimension. And so sometimes it's fair to say that he, uh, no, no flux given, no flux given. Yeah, totally. And, and I think that he, <laughs> I think that he understood, my sense is that he understood that he needed to kind of agitate the space to, yeah. to stir it up and make it interesting. And yeah. so formalizing lists of, of bona fide Fluxus members and, and then and then and an updated list of like, now they're, those people are off and these people are on, that that, that that was actually, and this is part of what's interesting to me, that that's part of the action that he was creating. And, and um, Yoko Ono, there's, there's some question about whether or not Yoko Ono was like officially a Fluxus member. But to me, that, that drama and intrigue, like it only kind of compels the whole thing forward more. Sure. Because it doesn't have to be like, oh, she was or she wasn't. She, she, was, she was around, she was participating in these kinds of things. Yep. All of the, the, the um, uh, grapefruit and the yam one, uh, that you just mentioned, like, those are like, those are fluxus forms. Those are fluxus you know, modes of, of making art. And she was a part of that. So I, I, to me that, that like, that's where the, the danger of like a point back to like our industrial model of education and really thinking, rooting, rooting that in physics, even though we might not feel that physics and math are kind of like what we, what we, anchor our, our sense of understanding on and there's like right and wrong answers because that's all that newtonian right ballistic like here's how the here's how the rocket's going to fly and fall and if we if the mm -hmm. wind's blowing a certain amount we can calculate all of that right but then there's this other space this other human space the space of art and life 
right? The space of art and life that does not work that way. And so like what we're doing at Castles and this conversation about Fluxus, it, it's like, how do we deal with the dynamism? How do we deal with the uncertainty? How do we deal with, uh, with, with going into a space without a predetermined outcome in mind, you know, and, and without a sense of control, you know, without a sense of control. One of my favorite, coming back to Yoko Ono, and, and this actually, this turns, this, I feel like it kind of wraps all of this up. There's a, there's a shirt that you can buy that says, John broke up Fluxus. That's funny. Well, that, and that's very, uh, you know, out the what kind of wink, wink and, and pretty niche. You know, I think I was talking to you too about like, what are, what are modern examples of Fluxus? And I think I, I'd asked you about like Pussy Riot being an example. And I, I maybe, uh, maybe we could do a part two of this conversation and, and pull, uh, some more modern examples and kind of continue the conversation. I, I want to be sensitive to time and uh, for both for you and for the listener. And um, this has been a great conversation. I mean, we've covered so much ground and uh, I, I love learning this stuff from you and I love expanding and it helps me the way I, my sense about it is, is that there's more awareness. I, you know, it broadens my sort of, that's the point uh awareness and, and language and way to describe things but also helps me to feel these emotions and and uh and so and I, I think back to the you know what i'm trying to do with the show and this idea of success is is more about um a wholeness and an integration of these different dimensions and yeah, uh absolutely and it's funny can i get back to the you know um the danger man inside of being above the line. I, I do think there's a, a element of um, enlightenment or some more probably better self-actualization to that where it's you're sort of, like, yeah. you're able to, for, for me, I used to be, he Jack talked about being the glue, like pulling you down from that stimulus response function. You're not being aware. You're just sort of reacting mm -hmm. sort of being able to be above the line and, and, mm -hmm. and use the emotions as signal. And, yeah. and, and then become able to have a strategy around, yeah. you know, I'm feeling negative emotions yeah. or reacting. And it's something that I'm working on with the team at work and with yeah. Holden, my wife. And like, it's just, yeah. it's part of that fundamental human experience. And I, and I think this, this idea about fluxus and the art and, you know, that it, cause you know, it's, it's like life, life is art in the context of life is this process. Yeah. You know, it's not necessarily this end thing that we're trying to get to. And is there so yeah. much data that, you know, no matter how much money you get, somebody always has more and you're never going to be satisfied with, you know, a dollar amount. And it's just, mm -hmm. there's, it's, it's more about just that, um, mm. you know, the, you know, it's kind of cliche, but like the, just the journey about it all. Yeah. Well, cliches are cliche, you know, they're like, they have purchase for their work. Yeah. 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 Any any other uh, closing thoughts or comments or things? Kind of step back and reflect. Um. No, I think no. What you said is really beautiful. And thinking about like it really feels like an affirmation of what I mentioned at the beginning about like the ecological, you know, and and moving away from a conversation about production to a, a conversation about enrichment and thinking about all, through all of these different things and the ways that we can expand our awareness. I love that. I love what you said about that and, and self-actualization and individuation. And, and when uh, like Rick, Rick Rubin comes to mind, you mentioned him before, but like that sense of like, you just meet the world where you're at and, 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 and let it be interesting and let it be, you know, and his own success right? Like he was just in the right place at the right time and just paid attention and, and has, encourages people to be in that way. And I yeah, think a lot yeah. of what we're talking about, I have a lot of intellectual, right? I'm interested in, in, in being able to articulate it, to do exactly what we're doing mm. right now, right? Yeah. To, to have a, com have a meaningful conversation about it. But really what you said about the emotion, it's exactly right. It's really about um, the embodiment of 
the fullness of our experience. And there's a rational part to that, and there's an emotional part to that, and there's an environmental part to that, and there's a relational part to that, you know, and we have professional lives. And I think the, the question yeah. is like, you know, what, what's really satisfying? What really satisfies me and, and not uh, over committing ourselves to any particular mode of existence like you know like being in debt that causes us to like have to work in a particular way right you know what i mean like to, to yeah. not get contingent in ways that are going to um to not get contingent to not get uh to not get over leveraged into any particular mode so that so that we're compromised in our ability to be whole and present and and have a sense of integration yeah in mm -hmm. the world. yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I think you're, when you talk about debt, I think you're talking broader, not just financial. Yeah, any sort of any over. I mean, see, you mentioned Dan Siegel, and his his model of integration is is that integration is the result of differentiating, right? This is different than this, and linking, and holding differentiation and linkage in kind of in a higher suspension. And that the, the problems that we have, and this is all from a really from a systems point of view, uh, that when you have differentiation and linkage, you have a system that's flexible, adaptable, coherent, energized, and stable. And if you become overly disconnected, right, overly differentiated or overly linked, you're going to experience chaos or rigidity, right? So, so yeah, the whole point. Yeah, the debt. It's not. It's not um, necessarily any one kind. It's. It's just becoming overly connected to our devices or our career or a certain mm. our ego, you know, or overly disconnected from those yeah. things. But trying to yeah. find like I want to be disconnected and I want to be connected and I want to. I want to hold that as something that is intention, like kind of paradox, you know. Yeah, love it. Yeah, I think I love the you wrapped in a paradox bow because uh, that reminds me of what Duke Stump says that complex is easy, simple is hard. And yeah, it's like taking all of this and coming up with a simple framework. And I think that's also the role of the artist and they, they yeah. help to like kind of simplify these into songs and mm -hmm. that are easy to remember. Um, yeah. You know, I mean, even like that Jack Johnson song, Better Together. I think that's his most popular song. It's such mm -hmm. a beautiful melody, and it's yeah. so true. And it's just like, yeah. hey, you know, that's a profound yeah. insight. We're we're better yeah. together. Like yeah. we're like you know, yeah. again. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna sharpen what Duke's thing just a smidge and say that I think that I think that complicated is easy, and I think that complex. I mean, the com complexity science is like is in that sure. system space, yeah. and I think people people need to to understand more what complexity is, and complexity is simple rules playing out at scale causing things like schools of fish to you know mm -hmm. to, to school together or, yeah. or the birds the murmurations of birds mm -hmm. you know so i think that complexity has this sort of balance between the simple and the fullness and that it's really it's really beautiful to to embrace complexity but what's challenging yeah co complicated yeah complicated. and complicated also has that nuance about the unclarity and messiness and you know just yeah. like yeah it is yeah. yeah i think that's a subtle but but powerful or sharpening yeah great well i'm really looking forward to uh having a part two and and, and three and having you back on the show and collaborating in this context i i love you so much i'm so proud of you and i'm so grateful that we get to uh have this conversation and, and share with the world and who knows uh maybe it'll inspire somebody to to do something crazy like go travel the world or you know do follow do, their do. passion heaven forbid yeah totes yeah awesome. well yeah you've been uh such an inspiration to me you know as your younger brother i i surf your wake in a lot of ways and i feel just so incredibly blessed for the the way that that wake has gotten very sophisticated and very um very nurturing and and really uh something that's just been so meaningful to me. So thanks for, you know, who you have always been and, and the way that you've become this version of who you are now. And yeah, it's been a pleasure to talk with you and with Bianca there in the background. And <laughs>
<laughs> so good. All right. Well, I can't wait to do it again and uh, stay awesome. And righteous. You too, brother. Thanks again to Christopher for being our guest. It is my pleasure to share his heart and mind with my community. I'm at Curdy D on Twitter and Instagram. Also, Kurt Derdix on LinkedIn. If the content moved you, please do give us a rating and review. Until next time, Curdy D loves you. <laughs>